now that you forgive us of any transgressions we may have committed against you, we ask you of this in your dear son Jesus Christ's name. Amen. The scripture reading for this morning will be taken from the book of Galatians, chapter 6, verses 7 through 10. Galatians 6, 7 through 10. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Well, as I said just a few moments ago, it's, uh, it's really good that we can be here uh, this morning to worship our God. For the few minutes that we have, as you pro no doubt have probably already noticed in your news and notes, I'd like for us to look at a lesson that I've entitled uh, Reaping What You Sow. It's based on Galatians 6, verses 7 through 10. No doubt a passage of scripture that is familiar to each and every one of us. Uh, one thing I wanted us to, to notice is that uh, we might refer to this particular passage of scripture as the boomerang effect. In other words, we're, we're going to reap those things that we sow. Uh, we noticed a few weeks ago in our lesson with the ripple effect that uh, what goes around comes around in many, many cases. There is one distinction that I want to make, and a lot of people try to confuse uh, this sowing and reaping with karma. You ever heard people say, well, that's just karma. Uh, th there's a big difference, and I think we as Christians really, really need to be careful uh, about making references to karma because of what it represents. And I try to give here, you provide here for you a brief synopsis of what karma is. It originates from the Hindu, the Hindu tradition and the principle of karma, the good or bad things that a person does will impact them both now and in their next life. Karma makes us believe that if good or bad things happen to us, we deserve it because of something that we've done either in this life or a past one. Karma removes God and Christ from the equation and teaches that we are solely responsible for our own destiny. Now when we look at that, we, we can see some, some concerning differences. And that's why we need to be careful about saying, well, that's just karma. And a lot of people have kind of incorporated that in their everyday conversations and it's a term that, that everyone readily understands and comprehends. But I think as we as Christians, this, this is not the impression or the message that, that we want to be conveying to others. Where sowing and reaping that we're going to be looking at this morning, the Bible teaches us that there are consequences for our actions in this life, but only this life. In the Hindu religion, they believe in reincarnation, that you have multiple lives. And that according from their viewpoint, we, we may have had eight, ten, hundred lives that we've already lived. And, and we may also suffer uh, in this life for the things that we've done in the past lives. Well, that certainly is not taught. Reincarnation is not taught anywhere within Scripture. We're told that when we die, our soul goes back to God. It doesn't come back to earth and begin anew. With, with a new body, with a new life, a new existence. The Hindus also believe that you may not necessarily come back as a human being. You may come back as a cat or a dog or a cow or, or a pig. You know, that doesn't sound very, very interesting or appealing to me. Uh, I wouldn't think it would them either. But that's their belief. And when we start talking about karma and kind of putting that out there as, as a possibility, then we are indirectly or perhaps even directly endorsing that particular religious view. 
It also makes absolutely no allowances that once you've done something that, okay, something bad's going to happen to you and there's nothing you can do to change that. It's kind of like some type of universal force out there that intrudes in our life. But with the, the sowing and the reaping, yes, we, there are consequences to our actions. There <coughs> are reactions to our actions, but we can always go to God and ask God for forgiveness, and he'll forgive us. So there, there, there's a process there that, that we can do because of God's love and his sending his son to this earth who died on the cross. So there's just a lot of differences, and we, we could go into all the various intricacies, and that's not what we're intending to do here this morning, but I, I just thought it was interesting to make that distinction between karma and the sowing and, and reaping. We want to kind of go to this passage of scripture that our t lesson is based upon and, and kind of unpack it and look at each individual point that's made. And one of the, the very first expressions that, that is, we are referred to is that God is not mocked or God is not fooled. And if you look at the definition of the, the words that are used here for mocked, it means laughing or sneering at God and his word. There are some people that say, well, I can go out here and do all kinds of evil, and I, I get by with it, and, and they're just kind of laughing at God. I've heard people, they say something, and they, well, I hope lightning doesn't strike me, because maybe it's a little bit off color, maybe it's irreverent, taking God's name in vain or whatever. And so there's no lightning, and so they just kind of laugh and sneer. Well, I got by with that. And here we're told, don't mock God. Don't sneer at him and his word. There are some people, you have a discussion with them about the scriptures and the Bible, and, and they don't agree with it. They say, oh, I don't, I don't believe in that. That's not, really, that's not really true. Or they'll say, well, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in the Bible. That probably isn't inspired by God. And so people just kind of laugh and chuckle at that. But there will be consequences. We're told that each and every one of us will stand face to face with Jesus Christ in the day of judgment. Granted, some people get by with evil in the world. Solomon spoke of that in Proverbs and also in Ecclesiastes. Sometimes it seems as if the wicked and the immoral of the world have an unfair advantage. They seem to get by with things. But eventually, there's going to be a judgment. In many cases, the judgment comes and happens in this world, you know, that's the way it is with a lot of criminals. You'll see someone goes out and for a period of time, they're involved in a lot of mayhem and maybe they're, they're hurting individuals. You know, we hear, we hear about serial killers. Well, for a few months or a year or two, sometimes more than just a couple of years, they're out there doing all kinds of things and people say, well, they're getting by with it. But eventually, what happens? They get caught. And then they end up they end up in prison for the rest of their lives, or they end up being executed. You see, there's going to be, there's going to be consequences for their actions. We can see that here and in this, even in our life and in the world today. And that's what, that's what Paul was trying to tell the brethren in Galatia. A lot of the brethren in Galatia were uh, thinking about some of the Jewish Christians about going back to their Jewish roots and abandoning Christ. And that may have been part of what Paul had in mind here, that if you go back to that, there's going to be consequences. He uses this sowing analogy, because that's one that, you know, back then, most of the people had agricultural jobs. That's how most people made their living. Either raising livestock or raising some kind of plants or crops to provide for themselves. And so, but everyone understood that. And so we can see that you know, if I go out here and plow and cultivate a plot of land, and I plant soybeans, well, at harvest time, I can't expect corn, can I? Because I planted soybeans. That's logical. We don't even have to talk about that. But some people think, well, I can go out here, and as, as one Old Testament prophet said, he said, you've, you've, sown into the, uh, you've sown the things that you've done, you've reaped a whirlwind. That sometimes happens with people. We look at individuals' lives and everything is just in complete disarray and, and it, it's almost like they have fallen off the edge of a cliff and it's because of the choices and decisions that they've made in their life. 
I've known some young people, you know, they, they kind of clown around, go through school, not really apply themselves. They get C's and D's, perhaps fail some of their classes. They don't do real well. And it's not because they can't. It's not because they don't have the intelligence. They just don't want to. They're not motivated. They just rather have a good time. And then graduation day comes. And they see all their friends. Well, they're heading off to college. And they think, well, I'd like to go to college too. Well, now, wait a minute. When you start applying to colleges, nobody wants you because your grades are so bad. Your class rank is so bad because you just haven't tried for four years. Now, you can turn that around. People do. They finally get their act together. They, they go to a junior college, a community school, start out. Maybe they have to take some remedial classes. But if they put their, their nose to the old prover proverbial grindstone, start working, then they, they can kind of rebuild their academic history. I've known people that have done that. It's hard work, but they do it. And then they graduate from college, and then they're able to get a good job. But they have to change their attitude. And that's what we're being told here. Don't try to fool God. You can't do it. You can't pull the wool over his eyes. God knows what we're doing. He knows what our thoughts are. He knows what our, our motivations are. In Galatians 6 and verse 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man sows, this will he also reap. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 12, 14, for God will bring every act of judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. And then in Jude 18, that they were saying to you, in the last time there shall be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. And we see that's true. There are people today that declare there is no God. The Bible is not really the word of God. People say you don't need to, be, to go to church. Just live your own life and do whatever you want and that's fine. As long as you don't hurt anybody. That's the philosophy. That's the outlook that a lot of people subscribe to. Well, something else that we can see is in our life, what are we sowing? In other words, we're talking about what are our actions? What are our deeds? This whole attitude of sowing something, as I said, they were an agriculturally based economy, mostly speaking, and so they understood this. Well, it means to spread, to utilize, to invest. What do you invest your time and money in? What do you invest your energy in? And a lot of times people say, well, I've, I've invested uh, you know, a lot into my job, and I, I try to save some money, and some people are really good at that. They do a really good job with their work, with their vocation. They're able to save money. They're very wise in that respect. But are they wise when it comes to their soul? In a lot of cases, they're not. They don't even give their souls a passing thought. Or some people think, okay, I'm busy all week long, but I will save one hour a week on Sunday morning where I'll go to church, I'll go to worship. And then the rest of the week is mine, and I can do as I please and as I choose. And some people think, okay, that one hour a week, that's going to get me to heaven. That one hour a week is, is going to make it possible that I'm pleasing to God. Ladies and gentlemen, that's just not true. How many things in life could you get by with for one hour a week? You ever found a job where you could just work one hour a week? Well, that'd be great, wouldn't it? If you could, you got a full week's pay for one hour of work. Maybe there's a few jobs out there like that. But no, you're going to have to work. It's a full-time job, 40 hours, 50 hours, 60 hours. Some people even work more than that. You're going to be a parent. You say, well, I'm going to parent my children and I'll give it one hour a week. How's that going to work? you got small children. It's 24-7. Children don't take any time off. They, they have needs all the time. There's times they get sick. There's times they can't sleep. And you know what? They want you to stay up with them when they can't sleep. Every time I, we call and talk Josh and Tish, they got two little ones, and Josh is, Josh is always saying, oh, there's no sleeping going on around here. The kids aren't sleeping, and mom and dad's not sleeping. And often that's just something you have to endure and cope with and do the best that you can until the children age and grow older, and eventually they'll sleep through the night. But you don't just give it an hour a week, do you? You're going to have to do a lot more. That's true with a lot of things in life. 
And it's also true in our service to God. It wasn't true with the children of Israel. Okay, God, we'll worship and serve you. We'll give you an hour a week on the Sabbath day. No, he said the whole Sabbath day was to be set aside and, and to, kept, to be kept holy. In Galatians 6, and verse 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. Job 4, verse 8, according to what I have seen, those who plow iniquity... And those who sow, sow trouble harvest it. I like that verse. That's a good verse as it applies to, to our lesson this morning. According to what I have seen, those who plow iniquity and those who sow trouble harvest it. And that is so true. In 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6, Now this I say, he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. We see that's, that's a... A truthful statement, even in, in a worldly context, a person at work, someone who really invests themselves and works hard, they will probably reap more. They're going to get that promotion. They're going to get that pay raise. Where some people who are just there and they're clock watchers and maybe 40 hours and they, they arrive late and leave early, they're not going to advance. Well, something else that we see is this is a question, something we've been discussing. We just finished uh, on our Wednesday evening Bible study, Zoom class, a discussion on, on looking at the list recorded for us in Galatians 5, verses 19 through 21, on the works of the flesh. And a lot of people are sowing works to the flesh. And you go to that passage of Scripture, and we looked at each one of those that's listed there for us. Now, when we're talking about this, what we're really talking about is the part of us that wants to be independent from God. There is a side of us that wants to be independent. I don't want to do what God wants me to do. I want to do what I want to do. I want to please myself. I want to satisfy myself. I, I'm not interested in trying to, to please God. In Galatians 6 and verse 8, For the one who sows to his own flesh shall reap from the flesh, reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. Ask yourself this question, which are you sowing to? The flesh or to the Spirit? It's a good question, it's a fair question. And we need to really be... Honest in answering it. In Romans 6, verse 13, And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. That's well, something else that we see. Hopefully we're not sowing to the flesh, but we're sowing to the Spirit. We're sowing to the Spirit. In other words, we want to do those things that are pleasing to the Lord. Every congregation should ask themselves that question. Anything new that they may be considering or thinking or reflecting upon as a work of the church, they need to ask the question, is this authorized? Will this please God? Or are we just doing this so we'll be like all the other churches in town? Are we just doing this so that we can be more popular and more appealing to the community and perhaps then we can bring more people in. So often that's the sole motivation. Well, if it is, then we could do all kinds of things. We could bring in a carnival and set it up in the parking lot. We could bring in a circus. We could do all, well, that'd bring people in, wouldn't it? It doesn't have much spiritual value. It's not really a work of the church. That's not what the church is supposed to do. We're not in the business of entertaining people. But a lot of times people use the rationale, well, we'll entertain them, we'll bring them in, and then we'll teach them. And then what often happens is all that takes place is the entertaining, or we'll feed them. And they feed them, but there's really no teaching that goes on. Well, in Galatians 6, and verse 8, For the one who sows to his own flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. We see a lot of churches getting involved in all kinds of things. As I said a few moments ago, entertainment. Using that as a, an evangelistic tool, trying to bring people in to the church. 
We just got, went through a, a presidential election, uh, and a lot of times churches and preachers, they want to get involved in politics. Oh, we're going we're to endorse and support a candidate. We're, we're going to get behind that, and we're going to invite him to come in, and we're going to have him, you know, give a talk at, at one of our worships there. On Sunday morning, prime time, we'll have a candidate come in. It's not the work of the church. We never find any examples of that in, in the New Testament. But it's just another example of churches and preachers and, and leaders of various churches getting involved in things they shouldn't be involved in. Sometimes they say, well, we're going to get set up in education. We're going to, we're going to form and create schools. There's nothing wrong with education. Education is a good thing. But that's not the work of the church to get involved in secular education. Teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic to everyone. Yet, yet we see a lot of the large denominations and churches, they have the private uh, parochial schools. And people say, well, you can get your best education at one of those schools. That may be, but you're also going to get a large, huge, heavy dose of their, their dogma, their teaching. And their religion, which can end up being quite confusing to young people as they're growing up. And so parents have got to weigh all this out. This is not part of the work of the church. And so often congregations and churches get involved in so many other things. Rather than preaching and teaching the gospel, they don't have any time to do what the Lord really intended for them to do. We're trying to meet communities' needs. Well, that's what the government's for. Okay, We have all kinds of government organizations that kind of create a safety net to try to help people. That's worthy. That's fine. There are a lot of people out there who, who have needs. We don't want anybody to starve and to go hungry. But that's, that's where the government comes in or other community organizations. In Romans 6 and verses 20 through 23, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We need to be sowing to the Spirit so that we can reap salvation. And as we've emphasized so many times before, we can't do it all on our own. It's just like farmers. Sometimes farmers can get a little bit arrogant and they say, I did all the work. I cultivated. I seeded. I planted. I, I did the weeding. I did the harvest. I did all the work. Oh, really? Where'd you get the dirt? Where did you get the sunshine? Where did you get the rain and the water? Did you generate all that too? <laughs> and I think that's a perfect example of how things work for us, is with farmers. They've got their work to do. They've got to cultivate. They've got to plant their seed. They've got to harvest. But they also need God's help, and that's true with our salvation. We've got work we need to do, but we also need God's forgiveness. We need God's mercy. We need God's grace. We need the blood of Jesus Christ. So we've got our work to do, and God does his part. And then we can acquire salvation. We need to be sowing to the Spirit, and not the world. Well, we ask this question, are we going to reap or weep? Sadly, that's the way it's going to be in the day of judgment. The faithful, the loyal to God, committed, they're going to reap salvation. They're going to reap eternal life in heaven. Those that sowed to the world, to the flesh, they're going to weep. We can read in the Bible where it talks about how there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth in hell. Extreme sorrow and grief. Because then it will finally dawn on people, I sowed the wrong kind of seed. I went in the wrong direction. I was living for the world. I was living for the flesh. And I didn't do anything for the spirit of God. We're talking about eternal life or corruption. Galatians 6 verse 8 as we get back to our text. For the one who sows to his own flesh shall 
from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap eternal life. And I won't read all of this again because this is what we've been looking at in our Wednesday evening Bible study class, the, the deeds of the flesh or the works of the flesh found in Galatians 5, verses 19 through 24. But I will read the underlying section where he says, I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he gave them a list. You look at this list here, this gives you a good idea of what it means to sow to the flesh. There it is in black and white. So when they say, well, what does that mean, sowing to the flesh? This is a good passage of scripture to go to. So this is exactly what it means. There's many others that, that you could go to. And then the passage of scripture that follows this is the fruit of the Spirit. And that gives you a good example of what it means to sow to the Spirit. Paul's really good. He says, this is what you ought to do. Then he gives us a list. Listing those things that we, we need to do. Unfortunately, a lot of people today, they don't like Paul's list. Keep in mind, these are inspired by God. They don't like it. Oh, that's not politically correct. That's not what I think. Oh, that's not what, people aren't going to like that on social media. If, we, if I said anything like that on Facebook, well, I'd be tarred and feathered. That's what a lot of people think. But we have to get back to this original question. Will I reap or will I weep in the day of judgment? Some people say, okay, okay, I, I want to I reap the Spirit, but I also want to I also want to sow a little bit to the flesh, just a little bit. So I can go out there and have fun. Sow just, just a little bit to the flesh. That doesn't work that way. You remember Paul saying that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? He's talking about influence, but that's also true in our lives. A little bit of sin will spread throughout our life. It'll begin to overwhelm us and dominate us. It's kind of like if you have a, a flower garden or, or a vegetable garden, and, and you look out there, you go out there one morning and say, well, I see a few little weeds, but it, it's not really a big deal, and, and uh, it's kind of hot today, and, and my back hasn't been feeling real good. I, I'll just let that pass. It, it's fine. And then you come back a few days later or a week, and now it's like weeds are everywhere. <laughs> They're all over that garden. Now, now you've got a, a little job has now turned into a great big job. You're maybe going to have to pull out the rototiller. You know, really go out and work hard because weeds grow quickly. And when we start sowing, even if it's just a little bit to the flesh, it'll eventually overwhelm us and dominate our lives. Jesus said it better than any of us could. John 8, verse 34 Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave. We don't like slavery. We fought a war over that in our country years ago. At the time of Christ, that was pretty much the way the world was. And, and slavery wasn't reserved just for some race of people or group of people. It was if one country conquered another country, then usually all of the citizens in that country were enslaved. Men, women, and children. It was a cruel and brutal time. And we're thankful that our society today has, has set that aside and put it away. But yet when we sow to the flesh, we're enslaving ourselves. We hate slavery, but that we're doing it voluntarily with sin. In other words, we're enslaving ourselves to Satan. The only difference is it's not done by force. It's not like someone comes and places a collar and chains on us. That, that, that's not what's happening. We do it voluntarily. We enslave ourselves. We choose to do that, to turn our lives over to Satan. Indeed, we reap what we sow. Perhaps we have one in our audience this morning, who's subject in some way to the invitation. If you are, we encourage you to come forward, repent of your sins, confess that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and then we can immerse you in the waters of baptism. Maybe you're a Christian, and you've lost your way, and you need to come back and, and, and make things right. And we encourage